Pat, and here with their reaction to the fourth indictment of former President Trump and 18 others is our guest for today, Trump attorney for Save America, Christina Bob, and distinguished professor for Torah University, Thane Rosenbaum. Uh, Christina, I know you've worked with the former president quite a bit. Um, I, I wanted to get your thoughts about where it stands right now. Well, the president's doing very, very well. Uh, these types of incidents, you know, this is the fourth time it's happened now, and it only serves to harden his resolve to make sure that he makes America great again and we return the power of the American government back to the American people. Uh, as far as the charges go, uh, I'm not particularly impressed with them. I don't think this would pass on a first-year criminal law exam as a, an appropriate indictment. Uh, there's several questions, not just constitutional questions as far as freedom of speech, criminalizing tweets and criminalizing uh, political opposition. But she's effectively gone after her political opponents all the way through the Georgia Republican Party chairman. I mean, this is this is an attack on conservative views and on conservative politics. And it doesn't have anything to do with racketeering, which is what she brought. Uh, Thane, I want to get a, a, a ask you a question on this one. Um, why would the former president be charged in Georgia in the state if similar charges uh, were uh, or if he received similar charges in that federal D.C. case? Uh, there's one particular reason that uh, we can think of that a lot of people have been talking about is that if he is indicted and then convicted there, he will be unable to pardon himself if he is elected president. Yeah, Katrina, they didn't have to bring this. They could have said this case is so similar to the one brought in D.C., the charges are already being brought. So one is your idea, which is that he couldn't pardon himself. Uh, he couldn't tell the Justice Department to leave him alone because the Justice Department, if he were to win, has nothing to do with the Georgia uh, prosecution. Uh, and, and so, and in, theoretically, uh, he could be sent to jail if he's a, a prosecuting and convicted before the election, and he can govern from the jail. They would have to redecorate the jailhouse. If he, if it, if the, if if it's if he's not convicted uh, and the trial it takes place after the election, he could just go. Look, I'll call you in four years. I'm too busy as president. We don't have a process of normally prosecuting people once they're in the White House. But there is another reason, Katrina, which is that the D.C. case is based on laws, statutes that normally do not apply to elections. Which is why I've been on your show before and said. I don't think that there's much there in D.C. because you have creative use of the criminal statutes. Here, at least, they have a Georgia election laws that they claim to, that is violated, would make this different. But let me just briefly say this one thought. Go back to January 6th. This case is really about a problem that we're having, not just in the law, but in the culture, which is that if you ask some Democrats, they'll tell you that even the 30,000 people at the Ellipse had no business being there. They had no right to question this election. Not the thousand that broke into the Congress, but the 30,000 people that were peaceful had no business because that's what this case is about. The difference between overturning an election and challenging an election. And challenging an election is democratic, it's American, and it's constitutional. Okay. They're saying that 160 things took place, all of which were illegal, all of which were part of a broad conspiracy under the RICO statutes to overturn the election. Yeah. And that's what's so dangerous about this case. We're, we're short on time here, but Christina, um, as, as somebody who's practiced law uh, yourself, I, I'm, I'm curious at the idea of trying 19 people, one of them who's running for president, by the way, Oh, yeah. and has some other cases he has to attend to. And it's uh, Tom Del Vaccaro was with us. Yes. Uh, and I don't know if he said it on the air, but he mentioned, you know, some of these people aren't going to want to be in the same room with other people. So, well, I wasn't involved with that. I don't even know them. And uh, I mean, the complication of this uh, <laughs> gets back to your, your first year in law school. I, I mean, Thane could uh, uh, indicate uh, uh, agreeing with you, apparently, that it wouldn't even pass muster there. Yeah, this is such a mess. If Annie Willis's goal was to create an absolute mess for law professors to discuss for the next several decades, she has succeeded. Uh, <laughs> I don't see this going anywhere quickly, uh, especially if she says she wants to try all 19 at the same time. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. I just It's just a hot mess that I just don't see it going the way she envisions. Yeah. All right. We're going to leave it there. Christina Robb and Thane Rosenbaum, thanks so much for your insights.